<laughs> I'm almost set up. So, SQL Server. Yeah, I don't know if that's a leak in the roof or a leak in the yeah. sprinkler. <laughs> oh, I just saw the one in here that hall. Oh, that's the mess one. It's raining like crazy and snowing. Yeah. When can I get in here? Um, how much time? What do you need to? You need, just need to look at it. If you want to, we have class for an hour. There's a hour like at lunch. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we're done. Uh, we'll be around there. Okay, we'll see when we get Paul. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm going to get going. I think that everything is ready. You guys have any questions before I get going? I know it's really easy to just forget the class because classes so <laughs> all right so I'm going to do administrative commands um, I should look at the assignment to make sure I cover everything but mostly what we're going to talk about I do a lot of this in the summer and this is just sort of like a quickie overview but I'm going to talk about um, logins and um, users We'll talk a little bit about uh, schema. We did a tiny bit with schema before. We'll talk about roles uh, and basically setting up permissions. And I think I might have done something like asked you to back up the database. So we'll do some of those things. A whole of uh, uh, SQL, which your book doesn't cover, but that's really there for administrating the uh, SQL Server. You know, setting up security, backing it up, restoring it. There's, I mean, there's a ton of stuff. Uh, setting files, you know. So partitioning files, we're not going to do that today, but all sorts of different things that are really about just optimizing the server, making sure that it's secure, making sure that it's, um, you know, performing what it needs to be done. So <clears throat> you should have some, I think, just sense of those. So for the logins and users, you guys know there's two big words here. I think you probably know what they mean pretty easily. There's authentication, and then there's authorization. What's authentication? Verifying whether uh, a user can uh, can do something or log on. Basically, yeah. Identify them. Uh, yeah, identify. Who are you? Are you who you say you are? Now, there's lots of ways to do that. Um, in, in SQL Server, you can do it through Windows, right? If you have a Windows account, you can map that account to SQL Server. Uh, you can map it. Uh, 
your permissions in Windows server, you might count equal server, you grant permissions to that window or assign that user to a role, which is a better route. We'll do that in a moment. So there's Windows authentication. That only works if you're logging into Windows, right? If you're coming in from a Mac or a Linux machine or the internet, that doesn't work. So uh, there's another way, which is the uh, SQL authentication, and that's additional. That's where you have a username and password. There's other ways, too, which I'm not going to go in right now. You can come in with a certificate. You guys know what certificates? Identi uh, system-wide identification. Right, and basically, I've never understood why they're considered secure, but they do. Uh, yeah, you just pay for one. <laughs> Don't they use public key, private key? Some of them do, not all of them, but you can. Uh, and there is there is encryption in here, but you still, the way you get a certificate is you buy it. So, <laughs> uh, if you wanted to, I mean, Basically, a certificate says, I really am Microsoft, or I really am this. And I don't know what the process goes into allowing you to buy it. I assume there's some verification that has to happen. But <laughs> um, and you, you can encrypt. You can do uh, secure. Let me open up like the. There's logins. Um, but there's other credentials. Actually, we don't have any. Where would I want to look at that? But anyway, there. I think we'd have to look when we create a new login. <coughs> but there are, you know, certificate uh, encrypted. You can have an encrypted key to come in. You can have a certificate which could be encrypted, and you can have um, or this password, right, or a Windows account. Real quick, although we're going to do this. Um, in SQL because this is an SQL class. I'm going to uh, just look at the properties of a new login. So notice there's uh, Windows authentication, which is the default. There's SQL Server authentication, and what you do has all this password stuff. There's map to cert or certificate, map to an asymmetric key, map to a credential. So you can do all those different ways to authenticate. There's also, I'm just going to look at this, there's built-in server roles, and we'll talk about these built-in roles a little bit. But as I said, we're going to, for the most part, these roles are there for, uh, like, bulk permissions. They're already pre-assigned. And uh, when you first do a login, I guess I should back up. Logins log you into the server. They actually don't give you any access to databases but it does give you access to the server. Typically, what you have to do is you have to log into the server, get access to the server, and then get access to the databases. So you log in through the server and then get mapped to different databases. <coughs> right now, if you were to log in, a brand new login, the only thing you're granted is a public role. Public role has zero permissions except to connect. And every document you read out there says never give the public any other permissions. <laughs> you can connect. You can't do anything once you're there, but you can connect. Um, so everybody is a member of the public, and you cannot remove the public role. These other things, like bulk administrator, that actually, all it allows you to do is bulk inserts, period. That's the only thing you can do. You can't read the database, can't do anything. You can just do bulk inserts. DB Creator lets you create databases. Uh, Disk Administrator lets you handle the files. Um, process Administrator lets you monitor processes and start and kill processes. Uh, security Admin means you can create users and logins and assign permissions. It still doesn't mean you can read the database. None of these mean you can read any databases. Uh, server admin for things like starting and stopping the server, uh, the you know process just watching the server. Some of the things that are server level act. Setup admin allows you to run um, installations and setup for the server. 
new servers on the, actually I don't know if you could do it on a new server because it's in the server. Anyway, sysadmin gives you most for missions. I, I, I don't use these roles much. And, and there are similar roles for databases that are pre-built. So when I go into security, when I do a database, so let's do like community assist. Notice it also has a security. <coughs> I hit storage, I want security. Um, it has users, right? So they're built, users are always, always, and there's a, is an exception, but users are generally always mapped to the login. Uh, there are roles, and there are these also built-in database roles. And again, I never can you see them. Oh yeah, <coughs> I almost never use these. And again, you're always once you've access to the database, you're like, but that's all you have access to is you can connect to the database. You can't read anything. You can't do anything. Um, Basically, you just hang there until you have other permissions. And you see there's access admin, backup operator, data reader, data writer. Sometimes when I'm testing things, I just make members of data reader, data writer. In real life, I wouldn't do that because data reader can read everything. The data writer can write to anything. So they can do inserts and updates of that data writer. They can do um, read everything. There's no variation in here. There's no separation of what you can see and what you can't see. So I generally don't use these roles except to test things. They also have deny data reader and deny data writer, and I don't know why. We'll talk about permissions in a little bit, but essentially deny is not ANSI standard. If you aren't granted a permission, you don't have it. Right? So you have to explicitly grant a permission. Why deny something when you just could not grant it? <laughs> um, DB owner, we see that a lot. DB owner, that means you can do everything. The database is yours. And uh, security admin, again, you can set up users and set up permissions. So those are built in roles. We'll look at those in a moment. What else was I going to say about security? This is a little bit, I think I got ahead of myself a little bit there, but. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually, so say you write a program that needs to access the database and it needs to have certain kinds of permissions that are related to not a user but to the application. So you can, you can set that kind of system up. It'd be an external application, yeah, that's talking to the thing. And again, um, there are permissions and things that are in here, but it, overall, I, I make my own rules. So one of the things, part of what we're going to do first, and the biggest part of this will be security. So we've got logins and users. Uh, before you ever make a database, you should spend time thinking about what are the security requirements for the database. What roles are you going to have? How are you going to log in? You know, all that kind of, all those kinds of things. You should think them through. We're just going to kind of go through and do the SQL. But I just, you know, it's actually something that should take a lot of thought. Does that make sense? Um, you, you have to figure out who are your users. What, what you need to do. General thumb is should uh, only allow users as many permissions as they need to do as they need to do their job and no more. Right? The general attitude of a typical database administrator is that users are evil. Can you say that, uh, like permissions to basically expire after a amount of time, so that it has to be reviewed again? Actually, yeah. there might not. It, with what we're going to do, but you might be able to do that under, so in the database, could it be under the service broker, services, and turn, there's a place where you can set rules. Okay. And you can make uh, like passwords expire. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. In fact, they do by default. You have to almost say not to let them. My application holds open. Well, I'm not sure there's anything to open in there, is there? Well, let's see. Yeah, I don't think there's anything in there. <laughs> I think when you create an application role, you actually have to make a role. <laughs> and it's for an application, right? We're going to make roles for people. <clears throat> there's also different ways you can do these logins. In Community Assist, I'm just going to real quickly do so when we look at uh, person in community assist, uh, I have to be in community assist. We have um, the username is the email, and there's a password that's hashed. So this is obviously not the where you're logging in. To um, the server, right, or even the database. This is internal here. So these are mostly for like an application. You still have to come through the server to the database, and then you would have to check this. So the way this kind of thing works generally is that you have a, a generic login, right, from the from the web page or wherever. And what this login comes in, and it has its own permissions. And the general permission should be that you can only see the person picking, right? And, and they probably won't even let them see it, but that it has to have underneath at least the permission to select from this table. So you're coming in with a generic login. You have no access to any table except the person table. And then what it will do is it will look at your password and see if it matches. If it does, it'll return it to the application, and then you might log in with a new role, right? You might log in. So say your password is verified, and then you uh, you are a employee or something. You might have a bigger role. Or you could just take the employees and have them log in directly to the server. Does that make sense? This is a little bit different than just a direct login to the server. In Metro Alt, I didn't hash their passwords because I figured that being kind of a corporate uh, database, supposedly, everyone would probably be registered on the server, right? Whereas this, they're coming in from the web, and you don't want to necessarily, say you have 20,000 users, you don't necessarily want to register each one of those with the server. Does that make sense? So you might have a generic login. And one of those logins does exist. It actually is built into Windows. It allows you to have a Windows authentication even if you're coming in through the internet. It's called I, um, I user, internet user. And so you can give it the permissions and then uh, authenticate them within the table. Give them a new role, sign them to another you know, appropriate role. Does that make sense of new? So you have to connect twice, basically. One with the initial I user and the other with a uh, proper role. <clears throat> As I said, all this stuff can be complicated. Um, but we're just going to make it a little simpler. So let's uh, make like an employee login. And we'll do it. We'll, Make it a Windows. Should we make? Let's make it a um, SQL Server login. So I think that's all I have. One of the problems with doing Windows logins when you have a single machine like this is that means you have to go out and create Windows users, and you have to log out of one Windows user and go into the other Windows user, and it's just a pain. I mean, it's probably worth doing at some point, but it's still a pain. <laughs> SQL Server logins. All you have to do is say create login, and then we can give it a name. So let's say this is for employees. So I'm just going to actually call it employees login. And um, I'm going to give it with uh, password equal, and I'm just going to do our usual. Now, there's all sorts of things that you can do, and they should have single quotes.
and I'm going to do, let's see if I can get this right, default database um, community assist. Uh, so let's take the quotes off of that. Okay. So here's a simple login just to create it. The, the SQL for to show you is actually pretty trivial. It's the concepts and the thinking behind it that would be hard. So we just create a login. It's an employee's login. I'm giving it a password. And uh, I'm saying that their default database is community assist. <coughs> Any questions? This will actually, despite the fact that we're in community assist, it knows that if you're creating a login, it goes to master. All right, so it, is, it actually won't. It'll write it to uh, master. So it completed successfully. And just to show you that it did it, I'm going to go down here again to this logins folder. I will refresh it, and you will see that there is an employee's login. Now, this employee's login right now has no, it can connect to the server, right? It's a member of public, that's all it can do. It doesn't even, although we said that the default database is community assist, I don't think it added itself to users. See, it, there isn't even a user for it in our community assist. So we need to create the user. And what the user does is it maps the login to a particular database. And it can have the same name. So I'm going to, we're in community assist. If not, you'd need to say use community assist because this needs to be in community assist. I am going to say, and it can have the same name if you want for, we have to say what login it does. We have to say what login it does go for. Um, and I think I might have to say for login. Where does the login end up again? So it ends up in the security folder for the server. So let me kind of close things up here. No, actually, so let me, as I said, let me just sort of like close up the database thing. So, there's a security folder that's outside of any of the oh, databases. So it's a, and, and under it, there's logins. That's uh, server level security. One of the things that can get you really confused is that every database also has a security folder. <laughs> yeah. And so now we should have a user, if I right click and refresh, Oh, you know, I didn't run it, did I? That would make a difference. What? Oh, it's employees login. Should we leave it there? Okay, so that completes. And now if I right click over here and do a refresh, we do have an employee login that goes to employees login. <laughs> Oh, or you do not have to. So this one needs to have an SM if you can change that. And you had an SM here, right? Yeah. So it should work. We still don't have any permissions. Before. What is the error of not permission? Um, yeah, just so it's not. Employees login. Did you 
So I'm going to do something else um, that we timely touched on a little bit. I'm going to talk about schema. Do you guys remember what schema? Which is <laughs> okay. Schema, as I've said before, is a really overused word. On one level, it's the description of the database. On another level, when they're talking about schema here, they're talking about action of books. Uh, and, and it's about ownership of those objects. So, owner. One of the things you can do, and again, it's good if you do this ahead of time and you think it through, is you can create a series of views and um, store procedures and functions that belong to a particular schema. So, for the employee one, let's do a quick. Uh, like a view for employees. So I'm going to first I'll create a schema. So I'll do create a schema employee schema. Now employees are actually going to have a fairly complex schema, but I'm not going to make it very complicated. <coughs> it wants a go. All right. So when I create an employee schema, under security, uh, in the database, there are, okay, so I'm going to close the roles for right now. We're going to make a role in a But um, there are schemas, and there's data schema. There are things in there that you might have that I've made. Somehow they get preserved into the script that I have. <clears throat> so, if I want to create things that belong to the employee schema, let's just do a view of the uh, employee's table. I'm going to create view uh, employee schema, let's call it employee info. Um, so I'm going to do this as select, let's do person last name, uh, person first name. And you might want to alias this. I'm not going to bother, but you probably would want to. So what else do we have? What do we have an employee? Uh, tables, employee, columns. So let's do uh, employee hire date. Uh, employee annual salary. We may actually have done this thing before. Employee annual salary. And then um, I'm also going to get a position name. So let's do uh, let's just do position name. Uh, 
All right, so we need to do some joins here, right? So I'm going to do, uh, actually, let's add their email. <coughs> it's interesting to play higher data isn't underlined. But anyway, from person. Enter, join um, employee on p dot person key equals e dot person key, and then we need to enjoy do a couple others. Enter, join employee position. I should have made something easier because the whole point of this is not to join the view, it's the on P dot uh, employee key, or actually on E dot employee key equals E P dot employee key inner. Why is it not? Okay, inner. Join position uh, position key equals EP dot position key. So that's a fairly complicated thing. So we, that's part of the schema. Uh, I'm going to execute that. And when you look under views, so there's a employee schema right before we had donor, right? Now we have employee schema, employee info. Let's do one other thing. What other view do we want? Uh, I just want two things, at least two things that belong to the schema. Employee schema dot uh, grant um, requests as, and I think what I'm going to do is take everything from grant request. So tables it's down here somewhere, grant list. So I'm just going to pull the columns. And I'm also going to bring in from grant view. Pretty much everything except I'm going to uh, remove the grant second request key. Okay. So and then I'm just going to do a quick uh, from grant request. Enter join. Uh, grant review. Let's just do that as R on um, R dot. Well, why is that not good to me? Tell us, guys. GR key equals R dot grant. Request key, and probably it's not giving it to me because that needs to be aliased. Actually, it's just a GR, not HR, GR. What? 
Should be okay. Let's see if I can get it all on screen. I don't know why that would not be. I think it'll work. I don't guess I like GR. From request, grant request, GR. It needs this to be, it, it's. <laughs> That's weird. Oh, select. How could I forget to select? Good eye. All right. So now we have two views that belong to employee schema. You don't have to use schema like this, but it actually can be really useful because if you create a, uh, an elaborate schema that belongs to them, you can assign permissions on the schema rather than assigning permissions on each individual table. Does that make sense? Uh, so it makes it easier to create permissions, assign permissions. So as I said, these are objects that belong to this schema. The other thing is that when you add an employee, or a person to a schema or uh, to a role that can see a schema, that's all they can see when they come into the database. <coughs> Do schemas make a little bit of sense? Yeah. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do, so schemas in this context are collections of <laughs> objects. So, so I'm sorry, did we connect the schema to that user? Not yet. Log in and see what they see? That's what we're going to do. And I'm going to do it through a role. <coughs> so I am going to do, I'm going to create a role. Um, and I'll call it employee role. Do I? Hopefully, I don't have any roles called employee roles. Uh, let's go way down here. No, there are actually no roles. Actually, there should be the there are the default roles. Yeah, there's no um, there's no employee role. And what roles roles are differ differ from um, schema in that, and rather than being collections of objects, a role is a collection of permissions. So I'm just going to create an employee role. That's all there is to creating a role. And then I am going to assign some permissions to the role. And the last thing we'll do is we'll assign the user to the role. <coughs> so I'm going to um, grant. Uh, so on basically select uh, on so <coughs> See if I can remember the the syntax here. I think it's like <laughs> I'm trying to remember the syntax. My brain is gone. This, the colon grant select on is it's <coughs> t 
two employee role. If that doesn't work, I may have to look it up. I think that's. <laughs> So, do we want to grant anything else on that? I, I don't think you can update or do anything else with those views, actually, because they're joined. So, probably just to select on those views. Um, so, this double colon always throws me. I always have to remember that. I think it comes from C++, not that that matters. It's a membership operator. Member, yeah, membership of a yeah. object, isn't it? Yeah, membership operator, yeah. So if we're giving it access to that schema you created, which you want to think it's in there, the employee info, is that? The, the employee that? info and the, um, oh, the grant request. And the grant request. So those, two, yeah. those two things. So what I'm saying, you know, if you did a really complex schema, you could grant, like this grants on both of those. And if I wanted, you know, if you had it fairly complex, you could say grant, update, you know, you could give them the permissions on the whole schema as a bundle and it just would be easier. I'm going to add a couple of other grants. Um, I'm going to grant insert update on uh, grant review, which is doesn't belong to a ski, it just belongs to DB, uh, to employee role. So that's then into grant review table, right? Theoretically, the grants request table would be filled out by web form, you know, so though you could give them that. Do we want to give them any other permissions? You would probably, if you were really doing, also probably want to in select uh, on uh, grant type. Is it type or types? Is the table name type? Type uh, to employee role, so they can see the grant types. And I think I will do, that'll be enough for the role. So I'm just granting things. I'll show you in a moment that you can, you can deny things, but again, deny is not ANSI standard, because if you aren't granted it, you don't have it. I will do a little uh, side thing on SQL Server. SQL Server up until about 2000 had a reputation of being a bit uh, open to hackers. And the reason was that they shipped it with everything turned on. And it was up to the database administrator to go and turn things off. Right? So starting with the 2005 version, they reversed that entirely. And they ship it with everything turned off. So it's up to the database administrator to go in and turn on permissions, uh, which is a much safer way to do things. Um, Add the role. If it, it can belong to multiple roles, so if the uh, permissions conflict, uh, it always goes with the more restrictive permission, not least. So you can't take somebody and give them an part of the employee role and then add them to another role to give them more permissions, <coughs> right? The least, the more restrictive role always overrides. So if you sign someone to public role? Well, the public role doesn't. Everyone is assigned to the public role. Okay. So that, that there's actually aren't any permissions assigned in the public role. Just connect. Right? Is there some way that the <coughs> deny permissions would be required to undo having given permissions or something? I suppose you could do, that, that might be why it exists is that you could give somebody, make somebody part of a super user group, but you want to deny that one person something, you know, or you want to deny a subgroup of uh, 
It seems like a, I don't know why you would do it that way. I think I would just make two different groups. I want to make as much better to uh, create, if not schemas, at least roles. And you should assign your use roles rather than assign permission to individuals. It's just a whole lot harder to maintain if you have a whole bunch of different users, each with their own set of uh, permissions. It's also harder uh, to get to the data, leave different things. It's whereas if they're a member of a role, you just remove them from the role and uh, no longer have any permissions. So it's just for administrative, you know, just hygiene. It's really good to assign people with roles. And you can have a role for most every kind of um, position. You know, you can think about what does an employee need to do? And if you have multiple different kinds of employees, you can break that up. What does the human resources do versus what do the grant people do versus, and you could give them each their own permissions, right? So, uh, and the role the uh, user is logging to their own, you know, uh, apply for a grant or make a donation. So it, it just makes sense to do separate roles and to assign permission to those roles. Does that make sense? It's just a better way to do it. I can run all these three together. The other thing I'm going to do real quickly, so when I go to database roles now and I do refresh, there is an employee role. And I'm going to look at the properties for that just because I want to show you kind of what it looks like graphically, what we just did. I hate in this Zoom. It <coughs> just trying to stretch it. It just doesn't read well in this Zoom. But if we look at securables, <coughs> it's um, employees, grant review, grant type, because those are the things that we did. And down here, it's hard to see, but we have grants. So notice we're on the schema, so the only grant is uh, select. There's a little check. Uh, permission they can grant it to other people. Right. So if you have one of the places where this might happen is in a stored procedure, right? Where they need permission to insert into a table or to update a table that they don't normally have permission to update. You could grant it within the content of the store. So and then they would the permission would go away at the end of the transaction. So you could do it with a grant. I usually don't do those, but you could. So I mean, it, it's basically like uh, shelling to root temporarily in a Linux environment or something. So you up your permissions briefly, and then it goes away once you're done with it. What? What? So when you check that box, what does that mean? It means that they can be granted this per permission. So typically, you wouldn't do a grant and then with grant. You would just do grant or with grant. So with grant means that they can be granted this permission if somebody who has the permission oh, grants it. And it would, uh, I would presume it would be granted in the context of, you know, like a store procedure or something. That seems a little bit, I mean, subtle to me. Is in there sense of, kind of a one-to-one -one correlation between the schema and the roles? So if you're so if you're thinking about them, so I don't know how often if you're doing them a mismatch afterwards, maybe not. But if you're thinking about them ahead of time, where you go through, it would make a lot of sense to create a schema that belongs to the role, and uh, uh, I mean a big schema that belongs to that. When I think of role there, I was thinking of just that kind of relation to the database, so an employee's relation or something. And then it makes the role, when you write a role, much simpler because you can just assign permissions to this whole schema. 
as opposed to signing it to each individual object, which is a sort of what we're doing here. Either way works, right? You don't ever have to create a schema. Uh, but you, if you don't create a schema, you definitely have to assign on that. So a schema, if you look at the uh, Microsoft examples, they take schema to look at table. Doc tables belong to um, sales, you know, and so when they do their roles, this is adventure. Has ever looked at adventure? It's Microsoft sample database. It's worth downloading sometime. It's free um, because all of the examples online. <laughs> you know, so. But it, they divide everything up into schema, including the tables. In my mind, it doesn't make as much sense to divide the tables into schema. I would rather do that with secondary objects like views and store procedures and things like that. But yeah, just not give them much or any access to tables, only through the store procedures and things like that. <coughs> So anyway, we have all of these um, permissions granted. Now I want to add the user. See, see if I can uh, implement role. So interesting this is I'm trying to remember the syntax. There's also a stored procedure you could use. Um, our user is uh, employee login, right? Without an S. Now alter role add Oops, not there. That isn't right. So it's just add. I know it's very simple. I could use the store procedure, but let me think about Anybody have a quick? Maybe it's like delete the user. Well, I don't think you can do. I don't think you see there. There'll be a thing here. It's in my blog somewhere. Also, it'll be in help. There is a stored procedure. The stored procedure is sp. Uh, I think it's role underscore add user. <laughs> But I was trying to do it without the alter rule underscore name with name. Wait, I'm going to look too far now. Add member? Yeah, add member. Oh, add member, and then you do the. <laughs> yeah, alter rule, rule underscore name, and then got it in braces. Uh, is this a uh, one word or uh, no. so an uh, alter role the name of the role add add Yeah, it doesn't like no, that. You, you, have a, you have a right. That should work. Yeah. Oh, it does. Yeah, yeah it's just. It out <laughs> OK. I knew it was really simple. I was just forgetting the word member. <laughs> so it's add member and user. Yeah. Well, the, the, so yeah, add member. I was saying add user. It's add member. Yeah, 
So theoretically, if I open up the employee role here, again, and do properties, uh, it has a role member of employee login. So now we can log in as um, employee uh, login. And we should be able to see just the things. Now, there's a couple of things we have to do first. So I'm going to like close down all of that for right now. <coughs> we need to right click on the server, the top level thing, and go to properties. And I really, this view really screws up my properties windows. Um, and we need to go to security. Notice that it only has Windows authentication mode checked. That's the default coming in through Windows. So we did a SQL Server login, so it's not going to let us do that unless we check this. So that means that we're going to switch it from just Windows authentication to SQL Server and Windows authentication. It doesn't do away with Windows authentication, but it allows you to do SQL Server as well. One of the reasons why it's not the default is that they say that SQL Server logins are probably the least secure. Just think of a username, password. You know, that's not a very secure way to come in, as opposed to Active Directory or something. <coughs> so I'm going to do OK. And it's going to give me a warning that I have to restart my server for that to happen. This is kind of important because if you do this at home and you don't restart the server and reconfigure it, uh, it will fail. And it won't tell you why it's failing. Every time you try to log in, it will fail. Now, so I have to restart the server. And the easy way to do this, I mean, you could go out and you could go to the config and all that. But if you just right click on this, you can um, restart. And do I really want to do this? Yes. This is a problem, by the way. You should think about this before you um, ever set up your server. So what kind of logins you want. Yeah. I should be able to. You just close it. it well, so closing and coming back in won't restart it. If you you, the service from the service. Yeah, so if you can't do it, what I would do is right click on the Windows button, go to uh, computer management, go to services and applications, SQL Server, SQL Server services, and um, you should be able to restart or stop it and restart it there. All these same services, by the way, if you are interested, are, are just in the general service. Service in general. Here, soft. It's under SQL. Is it under SQL? So SQL Server. But it's just so much easier to find them in that little folder. <laughs> this, by the way, is one of the most dangerous dialog boxes in Windows. You can destroy Windows here. Literally, you can destroy it to where you will never be able to get to make it work again. <laughs> By, just like By turning off the wrong services. or um, <clears throat> One of the, this has nothing to do with anything, but one of the hardest things I ever had, I had a uh, screen like this, and it was flickering. I mean, really bad. Not, not just your uh, normal little flicker. It was flickering to the point where you couldn't use it. And I went through, because it was some conflict with services, and I went through and turned all of these off and on, one at a time until I found the service that was causing it. <laughs> it was a pain, but I couldn't figure out. I, I took it to a technician. I took it to all sorts of, nobody could figure out how to fix it. So I did fix it, but it, took hours of going through in safe mode, going through and turning off all these services one at a time and retesting. <laughs> so, 
So, but this is a fairly dangerous window. Not only for that, but you have uh, your device manager where you can enable and turn off devices. You have your disk management where you can create partitions. It's a very, they generally, you can't get to this from the um, control panel. Particular uh, window, this particular thing is not available from the control panel. Yeah. You might have it under administrative tools, but I don't think it's from the control panel. They don't really, you shouldn't go there unless you know somewhat what you're doing. But. Yeah, I know the control panel is a pain. It's really hard to find anything. Add and remove Windows services, I always find hard to find too, because they don't call it add and remove. What do they call it? Turn on and off Windows features. It used to be add and remove, now it's on and off, turn on and off. And if you do add and remove, it goes to the apps, but it doesn't go to the Windows stuff. Anyway, so we have our role. We should be able to log in now. I'm not going to log out over here. Um, I am going to reconnect, though. So I'm going to click on connect here. <clears throat> and I will connect uh, to a database engine, SQL Express. But this time, instead of Windows authentication, I'm going to use SQL Server authentication. And it will be employees, uh, if you followed me, login. And my password was p at ssw0rd1. And then I connect. Now notice I have two instances of a server. One says Steve, one says employees login. This can be confusing, but it's really useful. So if I am exploring this, testing it, uh, and I find that I've made a horrible mistake, I can go back to the one that has admin privileges, make the fixes. I think I'd have to reconnect or refresh this one to see, but you can have multiple uh, you can have multiple logins, multiple servers, etc. The other thing to know is that this window is still logged in to Steve, right? So if I were to test my stuff in that window, I really wouldn't know what's going on because I would have admin privileges within that. Oh, uh, you can have. Um, so I'm going to go into. First, I'm going to just look at this here and look at community assistant tables. Notice the only thing I can see in tables are grant review and grant type, because those are the only two tables I have permissions on. And under views, I can see my schema views. So if I make a new query based on, so I'm going to do it on community assist, right click, new query. Notice that I'm over here and it's employees login. Right? It's a different process. This is 52, this is Steve, this is employees login. So I don't have permission on person. So if I do select star from person uh, and I execute that, it says I don't have the select permission was denied on the object person. I don't have that permission. Yeah, I use community assist. Yes. Yes. It's up here. It's because I right clicked from community assist. <coughs> it might not hurt to right use community assist, but because I right clicked on community assist to get the new query, that's what it assumed the context was. And because this is a SQL class, I haven't emphasized this, but you can always change your context by just using the drop down list. <laughs> yeah, until you've been one person object rather than one person. Right, yeah. And, and, and this one, yeah, it doesn't say that it doesn't exist. It just says you're denied permission. And if I were to do instead, um, so I have select on, so because I'm in the schema, do I need to say, I might have to do employee schema, employee info. Yeah, because I didn't make my person a member of the schema. 
which we could do. Employee uh, schema. And then um, if I could do that. So I probably should make them a member of the of the schema as well as the role. You actually don't make them a member of the you say that their default schema is. <coughs> yeah. Well and, and the advantage of making them a member uh, uh, this their default schema is that you wouldn't have to write employee schema anymore. Because it, because it's their default schema. Oh I see. Just like you don't have to do DBO because it's your default schema. No, no, they couldn't. I mean, you can only see what you have permissions for, whatever your schema. I mean, the reason you have to specify employee schema. Because we're still DBO by default. But, uh, but we don't have, DBO in this context doesn't have all the permissions for the whole database. So, you know, even like uh, we didn't give any permissions on donation. And again, it was denied. Did you change, you went through and changed it and restarted it and all that? Huh. So it might be your password. Huh. Yeah, I'm not sure. And you changed it to um, SQL Server login, right? So I'm not sure why that would be. I have had that issue before where what I've done is just created, real quickly created a new user and then a new password and some, you know. Um, or if there's anything, sometimes I just copy this. <laughs> you know, just copy the password that I did directly. Oh, yeah, yeah, try that. <coughs> try and create a new log. Yeah, try it again. I'm not sure why. The only thing I would want, and you said that the server properties say uh, Windows and SQL Server login. Mm. All right, so backup and restore. Is there anything else that I need to cover? I think I'm not sure how to, after the fact, let's try something. Alter. And I'm in Steve again. Alter user employee login. And I'm not sure what I want to do is um, <coughs> so that isn't quite right. How do, I know how to do it graphically. I'm trying to think of how to do it in SQL. Uh, I wonder if that works. Hmm. <laughs> So I altered the user employee login and at made this their default schema. Um, I'm going to disconnect and reconnect employees login, pass word one. Okay, so databases. This one is, should be gone. Uh, okay. 
let's do community assist. What do I want? New query. And what we did our view was employee info. So I'm just curious if I have to write the schema here. So it's, I, you know, I might still have to write the schema. No, it read it without the schema, but it gave me an underline. <laughs> because I am a member of the schema now. By doing this. All right. I so the last thing I said to have you do is to back something up, right? I'm trying to remember the assignment. There's backup and restore. Restore gets a little complicated because <laughs> there are various levels of restore depending on how you back things up. What I wanted to do is to just, I just did the select without the employee schema in front of the employee info. That being said, it, um, it doesn't seem to see employee info. What was that control alt? Oh, refresh I, this. I wrote it down here. Uh, yeah, it is. Control Shift R, and that refreshes the IntelliSense in your window. Okay. So if I do Control Shift R to refresh the IntelliSense, so it, it actually did now see it. <laughs> control Shift R, I have to remember that. I know, I wrote it down. Okay. So this one you definitely want to do from uh, Steve. Um, so what I'm going to do, actually, before I start this, I am going to go to the file explorer. I'm going to go to this PC, C, and I'm going to add a um, folder. So new folder. And let's just call it backups. And the reason I'm putting it here is that I really don't want to write a complicated file path. Because <laughs> you have to tell it where you're going to back it up to. And it's easier to say C colon backslash backups than it is to you know, go to some of the other places. But you need a folder. It has to pre-exist. <laughs> So um, let's see if I can remember the syntax. I haven't reviewed this. So I'm going to say back up community assist. So I think it may be backup database because you could also back up the log. And I may have to look this up too. No, actually, it seems to be happy with that. Did I call it backups with an S? Yeah, the folder. And it uh, isn't case sensitive in Windows. I think that, oh, let's do backups.back. Oh, backups. So file equals backup slash uh, community assist dot back. Let's see if that works. Oh. 
So community assist dot mdb. Oh, I think I have to give it uh, the whole file name. So actually, let's go get that. We'll send it two backups, uh, but we need to get the uh, actual file. So you want to go to local disk C, program files, SQL Server, SQL Server Express, MSQL, data. And what I'm going to do is get that file path. And then, um, and I'm going to drop this down. And uh, at the end of that, I'm going to do uh, community assist in DB. And I think it's two disk. And then it's C backups. Um, it's not complaining. Shall we try it? <laughs> Assist MDB. Maybe it's not MDB. What is it? Uh, I hate that it, but MDF. If you have, can you just let it, if you don't give it a target file name, will it? Same file way for you, or you said two disk backups. Yeah, so if you're going to disk, you have to give it a file path. You can also do two, yeah, and you can also do two device, where like if you had a tape to backup or something. Uh, what is it not like? Did I spell community assist wrong? Why is it say that doesn't exist? No, it shouldn't matter. Community underscore assist MDF. Sure looks like that's the name of the file. I'm just looking to see if I misspelled something. MDF is not the data. What if I just what if I just take that off? I don't think that's No, let's do MDF again. I'm going to real quickly um, missing a call. Um, can't type. Backup database automark to disk. Oh, because it just says backup database automark rather than a file name. Right, so I, but I thought I you had the, the whole file name. If you just put community assist. Well, we did that. And it didn't work? 
Well, so something was wrong. So let's try. That's what I thought I had at first. I used it to file. To file instead of to disk? Yeah, we did Maybe. Yeah, that worked. I remembered it was simple. <laughs> But I was, I thought I had an error. So I did two file instead of two disk the first time. Now you can also back up. Um, so let's go to backups. Uh, there's now a backup file. Right. You can also back up the. Um, the log. This one covers with a, you know, two disk and then backup log, and sets it up to the log back, and then uh, it goes through all the restores. We, as I said, I usually do that in the summer. It gets a little complicated. It's not so bad if you just have a file, like one file restoring, then isn't a problem. But typically, what happens is you do an initial backup, which is this what this one is. Uh, which means it's a complete backup. And then after that, you only do partial backups. So you only back up the parts that have um, changed. And then so to restore at the very end, you have to back up the log. Then you have to go to the beginning and restore the full one and then restore each partial one in turn up to the moment. Do you periodically do another full one? Like you might. I mean, you can do a full one whenever you decide you want to restart the thing. And, and typically, you wouldn't be restored. Well, so <coughs> typically, you would only restore on a failure. But there are other times, too. Like uh, one of the things uh, when you're log shipping, you do a backup and you back up the log, and then you go to a, another server and restore your database there to make a copy of the database. Because you can, you can create a copy of the database by restoring from a backup. So but on, on a standalone database like this, restore would probably only ever be used in a disaster, right, or recovery, so that you would do a recover. The other thing is, and you're only as good as your last backup. So one of the things that I would do in like in uh, again the summer classes just show you how to automate this so that it, you don't forget to back up it always backs up and backs up fairly frequently um, these should never be on the same physical drive as your database the backups should not they should be on an entirely different drive and uh, if the disk gets corrupted then yeah because if the disk is corrupted yeah you're just SOL your log file also should be on an entirely different physical drive than your um, data file. You know, and the backups and the log file be on the same same place. You could, although you know, the more you distribute, the less likely you are to lose everything. In fact, if you were really paranoid, which you probably should be, you probably should have your backups in more than one place. <laughs> Disks fail a lot less than they used to, but they still fail. <coughs> in fact, well, uh, in computers, I would say disks are the number one cause of failure. I don't know. Is, is there still RAID? Do people still use RAID? They still use RAID, yeah. They do, particularly for a database implementation. We're rapidly moving over to the solid state. The solid state disks are better, except from what I understand, when they do fail. It is much harder to recover data. <coughs> yeah. They, they're pretty good about it. They, they, they don't they fail very often. There's the space that they, that they watch themselves and map out parts that are failing to the, new, the extra space they have available. You can do that on a um, spinning disk, too. But the, the, I mean, the real hard the trouble with a spinning disk is that it's spinning. So there's, there's just all the. Uh, mechanics of that that could go wrong. The solid state doesn't do that, although the solid states do have limited numbers of writes. I mean, it's a huge number, but it's still yeah, limited. Yeah, the, the thing about it is that they get cheaper these days, like they're not as robust as they first were. 
um, because they use multiple layers of data that are written to those cells. And it's like so they, they, they have triple stack cells. Um, and that's where they get the high capacity to have less than cells and than cells less costing those chips. So, yeah. I don't know, like rate for speed doesn't as SSD, but rate for mirroring is for that seat. Right. So, like, so, we're not going to necessarily do this. They're, the most expensive solution for a Microsoft database is what they call mirroring, and you have three databases. So you have the primary database, you have a copy, a replica of the database, and these are constantly being, everything is, the logs from here are constantly being shipped to the copy. And in the third, it's not really necessarily a database, but it's a uh, constantly pinging these two. So it's basically there just to be sentinel. <laughs> so if this one goes down, everything automatically ships to there. Right? It, and you can kind of do this. This is the most expensive solution because you have all these com this computer that it does nothing but ping things to make sure they're healthy. You know, it's just constantly doing it. So it's expensive in terms of hardware to do that, but that's supposedly the most secure method of failover possible. There are other things where you have, and I'm not a network person, where you have your load balancing and stuff. You have multiple copies of the same thing where you're shifting things over. And when one dies, the load balancer will automatically shift the load to another, you know, computer, etc. It's amazing. It used to be not that many years ago, that you could do maintenance on a database, uh, you know, three in the morning or something. You go in late and do some work on a weekend and you could do some fix. But these days, most of them are running 24-7, 365 days a year. There's maintenance is a real problem. I can slow down the system, though. <laughs> yeah, well, like if for a restore or something like that, you basically have to take it offline. Um, what they do, I mean, now you can just shift to the copy, right? And fix one and then cut shift back. Yeah, as long as you have the, the money for this kind of infrastructure where you have multiple physical machines for every database, big companies do have that. The alternate thing, when the reason why it's growing, is the cloud. And they're doing exactly this. They're, they're having multiple physical copies spread all over multiple machines. It's just that if the company doesn't have to bear the expense. The cloud companies spread the expense across lots of customers. And so it's less expensive to do it in the cloud. You have to trust and you have to trust the data, which is sometimes a problem. Sometimes it's even a legal problem. Banks cannot have their, if they do it in the cloud, they have to have a walled off area of the cloud that nobody else can access. And that's true of, um, it might be true of schools. Yeah, well, what it means is that there's not, they're not generally, yeah, it's limited access, basically. <laughs> I think hospitals, too. Could be. Yeah. So it's, it's medical. There, there are laws about protecting medical data, and there are laws about protecting like student data. Banks have laws in terms of what they can do with the, the financial data, and so those things are difficult to do in the cloud because. Again, you have to limit the. You have to actually pay to have an area that is inaccessible except through your company. And so you might as well build your own. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that covers everything. Does it? Do is there one in the uh, in the assignment? In, in the blog, there's some restores. I'm a little leery to do a restore, but we can if you want. I don't think this, the reason I'm leery to do a restore is that if you do it wrong, your database will not be there anymore. <laughs> yeah, you could, you could create a copy of the database or just a bogus one and do a restore. The thing with the restore, let's see if I can go back to the blog, because there are restores here. 
if you're doing multiple things, um, notice that there's no recovery, no truncate. So you have to leave a thing in suspension as you restore each of the different pieces. And uh, once you um, are done at the very end, I think this one actually needs to have a with recovery. This might be the blog entry that was wrong. Yeah, so you, you need to enter, the last one needs to be with recovery, and then it returns it. But you can, if the restore fails, uh, you're left <coughs> suspended. The database is unusable. Well, so the one you're restoring, yeah. With one file, like our single backup file, it probably wouldn't. Um, hurt anything. Let's do a quick, we could do a quick restore. There won't be any difference, right? But so this is the um, that's not what I need. I need the other. Okay, so if we were to restore. Uh, restore database community assist and I think it was from disk this time uh, and then I think just the same file Now again, because there's only one file here, it shouldn't be an issue. It shouldn't create any problems. Uh, I cannot restore because it's in use. Aha, that's true. You have to um, use a master. And it may not work. Either and then I need to uh, close. Oh no, that's one I'm on. I need to close this one. Did I close the other one too? All right. <clears throat> so let's go up here. New query. Use master. I closed all that. Shoot, I don't think I have all that data. All the, all the stuff I just did, I think I may have just closed it out. Well, I can, I can restore that. I'm just thinking in terms of posting it on the blog. Of course, it'll be in the video. And uh, for what it's worth, I'll show you. I've done the same thing a dozen times on the blog. <laughs> Yeah, um, so if I restore database, community assist, uh, from file. Which yeah. disk? Oh, from disk, yes, thank you. Uh, C colon backups. Uh, community assist back. That should work. I don't have permission. Oh, I'm in employees login. All right, let me just copy this. So I want to do this from Steve, new query, control V, um, and there it, it, it did it. <laughs> so on the blog, because I wiped this out, you don't want to go to backup and restore, but you want to do like administrative should do it. 
and then administrative commands, create a user, create a role, grant permissions, add a user to the role. Although this uses the, uh, actually I have both. I have the stored procedure and the, uh, the syntax we used. Um, talked, we created a couple of schema objects. We did a, this one actually has a full backup, a differential backup, a mass, uh, and then a restore. So that actually has more. And that was the first thing that came up. That was last year. I think the backups and the restores, kind of like today, came up from questions. I mean, the, the different, not because they were in the assignment. <laughs> so if you have, because um, I wiped out my script for the day, there's that. <laughs> Just go to the blog and write administrative and it'll. As you might have noticed, if, the, if you look at these over um, time, I've done similar kinds of things from quarters for several years. So. If something isn't clear this time, you could look for last one and see if I was better. <laughs> All right, I think that's it for today. So Thursday, I will not be here because I have to go to a computer science conference, which I really don't want to do. But the lab should be open for Open Lab if you want it. Also, I can't be here this Friday because of the same computer science thing, but I will try to come in maybe the Friday after that if you need help, uh, not only for this class, but for all the other classes too. So. Are you going to bring back a lot of I don't know. I don't know. The Actually, the topics of the things are mostly about how to teach it and different things. So I'm not sure. Ed insisted that I go to this. so Not so much for the knowledge, but he thinks that we need to meet people and see what they're thinking about things. <laughs> so that part is OK. They feed you a couple of times, so that's okay. Huh. <laughs> you get a chance. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. Um, I said, hey, that's uh, hey, that's important. Yeah. Uh, I do have a question. Now. Okay. Um, I'm still trying to catch up, and I'm getting, I'm running the incident drivers for the set operators. Yeah. Set operators. So we can't do select So
I, I honestly just read it. Yeah. Oh. So yeah, I, I didn't actually. But it made sense. Uh, I might have even guessed right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So at least you can spend time with it now. So yeah. Hopefully, you can just set up better for the next quarter. Installations. And it looks like they have a Windows 7 Enterprise, so let's go with that one. Let me check to see if they have this They've got a 7 Enterprise, so we'll install that on your machine. Uh, I'm going to talk to Eli and make sure I get all these installers from their server tomorrow. And then we'll be able to um, we'll be able to install that utilizing the school key and basically we'll say that that's okay. So we'll be able to put Windows 7 on there for you. And I've got all the window all the yeah. SQL server stuff, so that should go pretty well. But this is still gonna want to update a whole bunch once we install it. Yeah, and it's like six hours of update. So what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna try to install 
as little as possible without having to incur such large updates. And then you can take your machine home, and then you'll have to plug it in, and then just keep running the updates. Which um, might be six hours. It might be. And if you're not used to doing that, it might be confusing and maybe problem, which is why I was considering taking the machine home with me and doing the updates to make sure that there's any headaches. Because I, I have in the past had problems with Windows 7 updates got erroneous and then it, it wanted me to keep doing the same step over and over and then there was one time where I just wiped it and started all over again. Mm -hmm. My rule is always to update, it, it, to install updates by the year. <laughs> if, you, if you try to do them all at once, it, it gets confused, I think. But that's my own, that's my own speculation on that. But, um, so, I mean, the laptop's really not useful to you right now in its current state. Is that correct, or do you use it regularly? I still use it. Okay. So we'll try to get it back to you within the day. Otherwise, we have to arrange a time for Friday to, to have that given back to you, because I'm going to need to take it um, home with me and, and monitor all those updates, unless you'd like to do that. But I don't know if that's really something that you'd want to Oh, well, I wouldn't mind doing it. It's just that it wouldn't work for me. And when I get when I get somewhere where it's questionable, which one? Because they'll give you a choice. Which one do I click now? I won't know. Right, right. And the installers, yeah. I mean, it's more about managing the the updates. And and I'm not saying that that you would be capable of managing them, but you're also trying to get this done as quickly as possible. So if you run into a problem, I'm trying to eliminate roadblocks for you to getting a working machine so you can get on with your schoolwork. You know, so that's that's my only that's my only spiel. So um, that'd be the only reason I would suggest uh, that I would take the machine and just get it all ready for you. Um, unless you want to take the time to have a robot. I mean, you could have another. You could all go really swimming. Sure, are, is, you know, as long as they got their data, it takes about an hour for paper.